Very good afternoon to you and thank you so much for finding time to be with us today. Uh, this is Africa Showdown and on this show, if you're not too familiar with it, we get to bring you the latest from the continent of Africa and uh, we get to start with Kenya because uh, we are based here in Kenya, so obviously charity will start at home. My name is Miriam Ubudu and I trust that you've had a wonderful weekend and your weekend continues to be great. And so we have so much in store for you, but I mean, uh, a topic of the day is politics of violence and peace in Africa and of course we'll start with Kenya being our uh, you know to, uh, study uh, for today. So before I bring in my panelists I'd like to take us through the headlines of the leading newspapers today. The Sunday Standard and the Sunday Nation and the main headline on the Sunday Nation unfinished business at 200 days to polls day Today, January 9th, is exactly seven months to for polling day, and in three months, a party primaries must be held. Kenya is on the home stretch. We take stock of what key actors must do to ensure successful elections. Uh, that is on page four and five on this uh, Sunday standard. Go get the big prize, uh, Rift. A freeze a Deputy President William Bruto. North Rift frees their son during a rally in Eldoret to hand for votes across the country. In turn, the DP promises not to let them down and takes a swipe at trial for questioning how he spends his money. That is on page eight on the Sunday. A nation and just besides that of Njonjo's guns, orange imports and other bizarre stories that is in a special report on page 12 and 13 and Girishi on newfound dalliance with Raila that is on page 23 and then just up there uh, we have opinions by several uh, people, and one of them is Bishop David Oginde, and he's uh, uh, talking about to cremate or not. And so I think that is a conversation that has found its way again onto the limelight after, uh, you know, former Attorney General uh, Charles Njonjo, uh, you know, remains were cremated, and that has followed subsequent other notable figures in Kenya who have chosen uh, that as their way of, uh, you know, internment and, uh, and uh, you know, sections of Kenyans or uh, Africans are thinking, uh, this is not very well in line with our culture, uh, but it's something that seems to be now being embraced. So uh, Bishop Okide has an opinion on that. And uh, on page 16, and fight and win hearts, you'll find that on page uh, 17, an opinion piece by Isaac Kalua and Koki Muli Krignon, uh, Vijana Tugutuke Drive, you'll find that on page 18, and boycott KFC, get serious. That is an opinion piece by Clem Uganda on page 19. So, and of course, uh, in case we are not aware, the AFCON starts today in Cameroon and really there are some controversies that have started there. So we shall have that after our main conversation. And then we turn our attention to the Sunday Nation and the main headline on the Sunday Nation, Lynn Turi's spoils Wutu's party. It was supposed to be Deputy President's moment of glory with a pitch for his presidency and endorsement from regional leaders, and largely it was. But emotive remarks by Meru Senator invoking language incitement to previous ethnic violence in the region have sparked a probe by the DPP and condemnation inside the mega Eldoret rally on page four and five. And I think that will form a huge chunk of our conversation on the Kenyan topic uh, this afternoon on page four and five of the Sandy Nation inside Raila's new rainbow coalition, ODM leader crafting campaign that seeks to revive the 2002 poll script which swept national rainbow coalition to power, including a summit as he leaves nothing to chance in his fifth attempt at the presidency. You'll find that on page 17 and 18 of uh, the Sunday nations and schools get a 16.8 billion for new term, as C.S. Magoha uh, says, Education Ministry has released billions to institutions as part of the capitation funds for this academic year. So you'll find that on page seven. And of course, up there, we also have opinion pieces today by different uh, you know, contributors on the Sunday Nation, you'll find one by Tom Mushindi, Fuzz about potatoes versus the point, and John Joe Kiereini and the CMC offshore scandal by John Kamau, and the press bias and Kenyan selections by Professor Makao Mutua, 
Three Reflections from Desmond Tutu's Life by Sunny Bindra on page 29. It is time to ask the hard questions. Shofa Okore appends there on page 15. So that is what we have on the front pages of uh, the two leading newspapers in the country, the Sunday Nation and the Sunday Standard. I thank you so much. Just uh, a few minutes uh, past 2 p.m. here uh, in Nairobi. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, or oh, good morning, depending on where you're joining and you're tuned in today. I'm joined by Samuel Tawish. Samuel Tawish is our in-house analyst and he's also uh, a journalist. As Samuel Tawish, a very good afternoon to you. Thank you so much for finding time to be with us this afternoon. A very good afternoon to you, Miriam Mugutu, from our communication headquarters. Good morning and good afternoon to all the viewers who are watching this program, depending on where they're watching it from. And indeed, it's a great pleasure to join you on this program this afternoon. Thank you so much, Miriam. All right. Very well, nice to have you. So we are waiting for Dr. David Matsanga, who shall be joining us in a very short bit. And when he comes, we shall just get into uh, the conversation for today. So uh, before we get into the main conversation, Tawish, uh, we look at the violence and what happened yesterday uh, in Eldoret, the, uh, you know, uh, you know what Linturi is saying that now has even you know brought up a lot of conversation uh, even online Kenyans have so much to say and I think it's, it's just reminded people of, uh, in a bad state we were at as a country several years ago where such words were used and so I think the last I was watching at around 1 p.m the news at 1 p.m uh, you know, he was arrested. I think uh, he went with the police and he's written the statement. I think he was released. So uh, it is something that is an investigation, but we shall have a conversation about it just shortly. But before we get to that, inside Raila's new Rainbow Coalition plan, the story is on page 17 and 18 on uh, the Daily Nation. So... I'll just read a, a bit of that. And as the elections draw close, Mr. Odinga is not leaving anything to chance as he crafts a broad-based coalition that will see several parties support him and that there's a the Miola Omoja movement backed by the law, Political Parties Amendment Bill 2021 that is headed to the Senate for debate. And whether by sheer coincidence or by design, another near similarity between Azimio and NAC is in the slogans. While NAC had Hakie to Sasa in Amazekana, our rights are now guaranteed or are possible. Mr. Odinga's new vehicle, Azimio, has in Awezekana. It is possible. The ODM boss is further expected to rely on regional kingpins during his campaigns. So according to this piece here, Assam Tawish, they're saying, uh, what we see, the coalition that Raila seeks to build right now on the Azmiu Laumoja uh, platform is quite uh, similar to that of the NAC, uh, the rainbow movement that removed uh, President Moy from power. Are there any similarities that could be drawn or, uh, you know, this article is, is far-fetching? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Miriam. And um, in it, just for avoidance of doubt, uh, to make a clarification, uh, the uh, former and late President Daniela Moy, Moy uh, was not removed from power, but actually he was retiring from active politics. We all understand he was not actually defending uh, his seat after about uh, 24 years in power. And um, just like you said, uh, what is being formed now by the Azimio Laumoja, is it going to be reminiscent of what uh, was uh, the NAC coalition or the Rainbow Coalition in 2002? Um, I think so, Miriam, because again, when you look into the leadership of the country today, most of the uh, politicians gravitating towards uh, the Azimio Laumoja, uh, by, led by Raila Amolo Odinga, it quite brings uh, an almost similar picture of the Rainbow Coalition uh, in 2002. And apart from, of course, Deputy President William Ruto, when you look into the One Kenya Alliance, uh, people who uh, seem not even to be very sure of his, who is going to be the flag bearer for the One Kenya Alliance. So in itself, um, it is more likely that we are going to have uh, something that is um, almost equal to what happened in 2002. And even when you listen to the speeches by politicians, uh, especially those allied to former Prime Minister Raila Odinga and President Uhuru Kenyatta, they've been coming out in the open every now and then and reminding us uh, that what they are building a political juggernaut, one which is going to shake the country, one which is going to be equivalent, if not more, than what we saw in 2002. And it's just a matter of wait and see. And you can see most political outfits today uh, in this country, uh, maybe away from the One Kenya Alliance and the UDA uh, that is led by Deputy President William Ruto. All Almost every other political uh, party in this 
Yes, I agree. Can you hear me, Miriam? Yes, I can hear you. We had a bit of a, a technical hitch there, but you're back now, so continue. Okay, sorry about that. So um, I, I was just saying, uh, Miriam, as I wind up on my submission, that uh, what we what we are going to see likely is um, going to be akin to what happened in 2002. Uh, but what matters more is what is the motive behind the formation of this uh, uh, political juggernauts? What is going to be the motive behind uh, the formation of these coalitions? Is it just more of getting power or is it about addressing the issues that matter to the ordinary Monanchi? And I think as uh, voters in this country, as uh, uh, people who are going to employ these politicians, uh, we must be asking these very tough questions. And uh, these leaders must come then and tell us what is their agenda, what is the manifesto they have for the people of Kenya, even when we talk about this uh, politics. So it's, it shouldn't just be about the normal uh, uh, rhetoric that we are used to. It should be about addressing the issues that matter uh, to the ordinary monarchy and more so the matters or issues that have bedeviled this country uh, for a very long time. Miriam, I submit. Very well, and thank you so much for correcting us. Uh, former President Daniel Arapmo was not removed, but uh, he had said he would not run. But we know that he had uh, affronted uh, the then uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta. Now he's the president, but then, you know, he had picked him to succeed him after retiring. So, uh, you know, that Kenyans protested against that for how they came out and voted, but also the the, the motive, the motivation that brought together all these uh, political players that formed the NAG, the motivation then, how is it different perhaps, or how is it similar with the motivation we see uh, driving uh, political vehicles like Azmi or Laomoja? Well, Miriam, unlike in 2002, we all understand that uh, the uh, former and late President Daniel Rapmoy was not defending his seat. Uh, but this time around, we have um, a very elaborate constitutional order where the sitting president has already served, he's serving his second and last time in office, and therefore, uh, by law, he will not be defending his seat. Uh, we expect that it's going to be, of course, an, a succession in terms of uh, a new president being uh, elected and sworn into office. So in this case, I think those are some of the, uh, the differences uh, that you can draw from 2002 and now. Uh, but again, when you look onto, in terms of the uh, coalition formation, uh, the sim similarities that you can draw really or out of this is that uh, you having politicians of major uh, political parties in the country and um, the high profile politicians really coming together and uniting um, ahead of this uh, 2022 general election. And uh, this is what, of course, um, almost happened, uh, what we saw in 2002. And uh, if we are to go by the 2002 script, some people have argued uh, probably that um, given that uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta is working hand in hand with former Prime Minister Raila Odinga, speculation has also been rife uh, that probably is going to, um, of course, to endorse or have his blessings on Raila Molo Odinga to succeed him as president, something that is dispute disputable. And we've also seen the other politicians really who are contesting for presidency coming out and um, asking President Uhuru Kenyatta really not to get into active uh, succession politics or clearly tell who he prefers to succeed him. But uh, it is not um, really a secret to us that uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta has already displayed um, his uh, like for Raila Molo Dinga to succeed him in as much as he hasn't quite come out uh, to endorse him publicly. But you can quite read this uh, from his body language. You can see from those who are so close to him politically uh, that they are so much close to Raila Molo Dinga and probably they will prefer Raila Odinga to uh, succeed uh, him come this uh, August uh, general election. But be that as it may, Miriam, I can quite tell you what is very important for President Uhuru Kenyatta is not really whom he's going to endorse, but making sure that we are going to have a free, fair and peaceful election come August this year, uh, that his uh, succession is not uh, going to be won. Uh, marred by, say, violence or the issue of, um, you know, there's been these uh, stories about, uh, of course, the deep state uh, ostensibly trying to rig in a particular country, a candidate whom they favor uh, to succeed President Uhuru Kenyatta. So to me, I suppose uh, this is going to be one of the determining factors or parameters as we head into uh, this year's uh, August uh, general election, Miriam. Well, thank you so much. And I think, uh, as you said, President Kenyatta has not come out uh, to clearly, uh, you know, give support and say, you know, I endorse Raila as the next uh, president for the Republic of Kenya. But you've seen how perhaps he's been, he's been supportive in other ways. And because of that, um, you know, some sections, especially the politicians from other, uh, from the opposition who don't agree with that, are uh, saying, you know, the Raila, they term him a, a government project as 
Uhuru was when Moi was, was retiring. So they're saying the same way Kenyans have protested by voting against the preferred candidate by the then former president. Uh, they're saying it's the same way perhaps Kenyans will protest. What are the differences between then and now and perhaps the endorsements and, and the times that we're in right now? Uh, thank you so much, Miriam. There may not necessarily be, um, of course, what happened to uh, President Kenyatta's endorsement by, of course, late President Daniel Moy. Uh, we may not necessarily see that scenario, uh, of course, um, occurring this time round. Uh, for the simple reason we all understand that President Moy then having been in power for over uh, 24 or so years, uh, and the people of Kenya somehow had, um, uh, had completely lost faith in President Moy then, and they had uh, thought maybe by bringing in uh, Kenyatta as his successor was likely going to uh, continue uh, with the kind of um, legacy, the kind of uh, leadership style uh, that, of course, uh, President Moi uh, had had in this country for 24 years. But the situation is different this time around. I do not think that the people of Kenya really uh, are so, have that strong disaffection uh, towards uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta to an extent uh, that they wouldn't quite um, support any candidate that uh, President Kenyatta will be uh, endorsing, assuming he comes out openly and endorses. Uh, former Prime Minister Raila Odinga for the top job. But again, uh, you should also underscore the fact that President Kenyatta hasn't quite uh, come out to openly say this. And I think he's, uh, he's uh, becoming a, a bit guarded uh, so, no, so as not to spoil, say, for Raila Odinga. Uh, because again, you can see the other side of the political divide coming out and saying Raila Amolo Odinga is uh, the, a project of the state, is a project of uh, the deep state. And so he's likely going to get uh, favors and maybe uh, the government of the day support in as far as this uh, presidential race is concerned. And that's why you see uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta, in as much as his body language and those around him, um, I, I mean, really tells us um, his, his direction is more of supporting Raila Odinga. He's not coming out to do that because, again, he knows um, the, the kind of consequences that it could have in terms of maybe people who are not uh, really appreciative of his uh, leadership style um, for the two terms that he has been in power. And they wouldn't really want uh, maybe to associate Raila Odinga, say, with the failures of the Jubilee administration. So that's why you see Raila Odinga also coming out and rubbishing those allegations or claims, if you wish, uh, that is, um, of course, a state project. And President Uhuru Kenyatta also remaining a bit guarded uh, on coming out exactly to endorse Raila Odinga as his preferred candidate. So it's a matter of wait and see. Uh, of course, as politics center, takes center stage, we want to see whether President Uhuru Kenyatta will, um, of course, uh, come out and endorse Raila Odinga openly, or will he have, will he have to sit down and uh, watch silently as uh, his uh, predecessor Yes, sir. That is uh, Mwai Kibaki did. Uh, you remember in the run-up to 2013 general election, so many people were tasking and challenging the president to come out and maybe um, say who he prefers to succeed him. Uh, but uh, the former president did not quite uh, do that. So I suppose uh, the president uh, is quite uh, taking this, a similar cue. Uh, he may not necessarily come out to endorse uh, uh, Raila Molodinga, but if he did, uh, like what Moi did, I don't think that he's going to have um, of course, a consequence like uh, the one he uh, faced, uh, President Kenyatta himself in 2002. Very well, thank you so much. And of course, we shall get into the meat of that uh, rally that happened yesterday in Eldoret as we wait for Dr. Matanga to join us. But something else happened uh, during that rally, and that was the pronouncements that was made by uh, Kakamega Senator Cleophas Malala, and we do have a story on page five on the Daily Nation. Let me just read a bit of it. Amani National Congress ANC party has distanced itself from the Eldoret rally that was attended by Kakamega Senator Cleophas Malala to endorse a Deputy President William Bruto's presidential bid ahead of the August election. The party's Secretary General Simon Kamau in a statement to newsrooms yesterday said, the presence of Mr. Malala at the event was his personal, in his personal capacity and not as a representative of the party. Mr. Malala is a member of the ANC party and a close ally of party leader Musalia Mudavadi. Mr. Kamau said the party had at no time sent a delegation to represent it at the event, which was held at the Eldoret Sports Club, and that no one had been sanctioned by ANC to speak on behalf of the party. 
Now, the ANC party would like to disassociate itself from the activities taking place at Elder Sports uh, Club grounds where UDA party is holding its rally. ANC has not sent anybody to, rep to represent it, either the party or the party leader in the state function, Mr. Kamau said. So who do we believe? Because Malala was very categorical and said, don't just see me standing here talking as the Senator from the Kamega. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the party and my party. If Malala I just right to up trouble, or what is it that uh, is not being said that is happening? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Miriam. You know, uh, when you listen and uh, watch uh, uh, Senator for Kakamega Cleophas Malala, really it tells you that there's uh, something cooking uh, behind the scene. And uh, it reminds me, uh, Malala's actions and uh, the behavior uh, reminds me of what happened in the run up to 2013 general election. Uh, when uh, the former president and wiper party leader Kalonzo Msioka did come out and refute any possibility or likelihood of him working with Raila Molodinga in the run up to 2013 general election, uh, he said he can speak for himself and wiper hasn't sanctioned uh, Senator Mudama then really to speak for uh, to speak on their behalf. A and uh, Eventually, we saw Kalonzo Msioka really working with uh, Raila Amolo Odinga. And so when you see such kind of speculations really coming out, there must be something really uh, behind the scene that is taking place. You cannot quite wish it away. Mm -hmm. And uh, the body language and the kind of uh, statements that uh, Senator Malala has been making of late, uh, including that uh, impromptu, uh, as they put it, uh, visit uh, by Deputy President William Ruto during the, uh, the, the Mumias and, uh, I mean, tournament, it does tell you that uh, there's something that is being uh, done silently and behind the scene, maybe to see, um, of course, Musaliam Davadi work with Deputy President uh, William Ruto. But again, you can as well not rule out that uh, probably Malala is speaking on um, as himself, is speaking uh, on behalf um, of um, maybe the people of Kakamega, like he said yesterday, not necessarily because uh, he's um, maybe a member of the ANC, because yesterday, even when he came there, he did say that uh, he didn't quite have the blessings of, of um, Saliam Davadi. He's uh, speaking on behalf of the people of Kakamega, the ones he represents uh, in the Senate. But looking onto his position, he's one of those leaders in the inner sanctums of um, Saliam Davadi's uh, political party, that is ANC. And this taking place just a couple of days after the Buhungu rally uh, or event uh, organized by Court Secretary General Francis Satwoli. And of course, after also uh, the MP for Lugari, Ayub Savula, uh, decided to support the Azmiyo La Umoja. It does tell you that um, Cleophas Malala is very keen on seeing um, Saliam Davadi really work with the Deputy President William Ruto as we head into, 20, uh, into August uh, this year's election, Miriam. Uh, but just like uh, they have rubbished it out, we will wait and see. Um, Salim Davide has said when he makes any deal, when he is having any negotiations with any political party or any political leader, he will make it, uh, he will make it uh, open to the public, people really to get to understand what kind of arrangements or political formations that he will be joining. So it's more of a wait and see scenario, Miriam. Uh, we cannot quite uh, say with the authority. Uh, that Mudavadi is headed to Musalia Mudavadi. He could as well join the Azimio La Umoja. So there must be some negotiations that are taking place behind this in media. Okay, very well. And we shall revisit uh, the events that took place in that rally as we wait for Dr. Matanga to join us. Remember, our topic, our main topic of the day is politics of violence and peace in Africa. And Kenya will be one of the uh, cases that we shall be looking at. So we shall just leave that rally there and we'll revisit it uh, once uh, Dr. Matanga has joined us. In the meantime, we're looking at some of other stories that we do have on the newspapers today that are of equal importance and on page six as Kenya prepares to, to go to its elections in August. Civil servants are in political seats are in a dilemma following a legal question on when they should resign. The public workers are torn between complying with the Elections Act, which requires them to leave office six months to the general election, that is February 9th, and waiting for an interpretation of the law by the appellate court. The case stemmed from the 2017 Labour Court's findings that public officers should resign once they have been nominated by political parties to run for office. And uh, there's been two other cases that were filed 
by a teacher and an ordinary Kenyan at the High Court last week, seeking an urgent interpretation of whether it is discriminatory to compel public officers to resign in order to gun for elective positions. Now, in 2017, the Employment and Labor Court in Kericho declared Section 43, Subsection 5, which requires public officers to leave office six months to the polls unconstitutional. However, the Court of Appeals stated that, stated that the judgment pending appeal we will be in court on January 24th when the other case will be mentioned for directions, IABC chairperson of Leche Bukati said. And uh, just to take us back on the same issue, uh, hmm, a couple of now the court is expected to give further direct directions on the matter with regard to civil servants. The confusion is filled by findings of the High Court in 2012 and 2015 when Justice Isaac Lenaola, now so, so, uh, Supreme Court judge, ruled that six months period is reasonable and sufficient for candidate to prepare for an election. So this is something that already the court had previously uh, made pronouncements about. It's not the first time that it find, you know, it's finding its way into our courts, uh, seeking the court's interpretation. And uh, they cannot have one leg in public service and another in the elective area. The law was designed to aid them make up their minds in where they want to maximize their energy, Justice Lenaola during that truling said. And he continued to say that six months before the election date is sufficient for them to prepare to meet their fate at the election books. A longer period would be unreasonable and a shorter period will be more unreasonable. And on the same issue, Justice Mumbing Gugin, now appellate justice in 2014 said, the intent of the legal provisions was to lessen the considerable influence civil servants have yielded in public affairs, which could give them an unfair advantage over others in electoral uh, context. So uh, quite, a, uh, quite a conversation there. But should the civil servants, uh, you know, even going by what these two judges really ruled before, uh, should the civil servants, uh, you know, resign from their positions, earlier as the law states six months or should they be allowed more time to continue serving even as they pursue uh, their political aspirations uh, miriam uh, this country is actually not in deficit of uh, people who can serve in those uh, positions um, assuming maybe these uh, public servants choose to resign and go and uh, participate or involve themselves in active politics uh, medium uh, just like you said of course uh, it is not possible uh, that you can have one leg in public service and another one in active politics something that is not possible because one there's likelihood of conflict of interest in terms of your, the discharge of your mandate. And that is why it's advisable and that is why the constitution dictates uh, that at least um, any public servant who has any ambition uh, political for that matter must then resign uh, from, uh, of course, uh, public service and then engage um, actively in uh, politics. Uh, so it's something that we, of course, that is a constitution that we all, of course, we ushered in and um, we must live by it. I don't understand why people are going to court to petition uh, this position, uh, and those who feel like they want really to exit, uh, say, public service and go to politics, they should uh, do that because, again, they have been serving in public service, uh, of course, um, for the last about five years or some of them for the last about 10 years. Now is the moment when they feel like they want to go and uh, participate or engage themselves in active politics. They must uh, resign and go and engage because, Miriam, you can imagine you have somebody like Fred Matiang, who is Minister for Interior, um, maybe uh, still holding that position and maybe harboring um, ambition to be, uh, say, governor or even uh, president. So he's likely going to have um, undue advantage over other, of course, uh, contestants in that particular, uh, of course, uh, contest. And I do not think uh, that is what uh, really um, um, uh, Kenyans really envisage. And that is why we had uh, this um, uh, constitution put into place. That's why we had uh, this law put into place to make sure that any public servant who wants to participate in active politics then must resign at least uh, six months or so uh, to the uh, general election. So Miriam, it's something that um, I quite agree with. Uh, these politicians need to resign. There's no need even to go and uh, uh, file petitions to that effect. They must resign because they have chosen, they want to go and pursue uh, their own uh, political ambitions. There is no need for them to want to be in government or to, uh, to be in public service and, and, and at the same time really engage in active politics. Very well, so I see you supporting, uh, you know, justice. Uh, Mumbingugi is ruling there when he said, uh, you know, the public servants who are serving 
and if they want to campaign and still serve at the same time, it could give them undue and unfair advantage over others in the electoral context. And I think with the example you've given, all right, so let's just wait and see how the case now uh, will go on there in the courts. So we're joined, uh, I told you earlier, we're waiting for Dr. David Matanga for us to start our conversation on the main topic of the day, and that is the politics of violence and peace in Africa. And Dr. Matanga has joined us uh, doctor, very good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Miriam. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, as you know, I'm on, uh, I have a, a video that I am, where we have a virtual television, a virtual Zoom up to late. So I had a very long night up to three, as you know, mourners. Those who, very many who are on there, you can't tell them, go home. People want to sing songs even now. That's the type of, of, of burying people right now in, in so many places. I did not know. I had not experienced anything after COVID, but I saw this now on, on me. So I, I, I stayed late up to 3 a.m. still on the video. You can imagine from 8 p.m. to 3 a.m. It was a long hour. So many people kept on going, coming in. So thank you very much. At least we are making a headway. But thank you very much, uh, uh, viewers across the continent of Africa. Our main topic, uh, Medium and Tawisha have discussed the Kenyan news exhaustively, but I want it links. Why I chose this topic is links exactly with what Ruto is doing in Kenya and why we don't learn lessons. We don't see the lessons of why things should not be repeated. History can be repeated when it, it is a good history. Nobody refuses to learn about what happened. But when you are repeating it and making it worse, it is also very, very dangerous, medium. And that is exactly the topic of today, the politics of violence and peace in Africa. Have we got more peace or more violent during elections? Are we more violent during elections? I see the answer will automatically come yes. When the Kenyans saw, heard about 2022, the entire country was 2022. In Matatu, in the buses, at the airport, in the plane going to London, to Dubai, people talk about 2022. Now, the 2022 is not talked about because people like talking about a 2022, but the people, most of them, talk about 2022 because of the statements that the politicians are making. They worry people. And if Tawish maybe has said it already, and the medium, yesterday was the beginning of the Peter President's downfall. Complete downfall. He watched. He should have sprung on the pub podium and I picked a microphone as a head of a deputy head of state and they and then rebuked actions of one of his lieutenants. He would have earned more votes in Mount Kenya. But believe me or not, even the people, the MPs who claim to be very close to Ruto, very shortly, with the statement that took place in the center, the epic center of violence in Eldoret yesterday, some of them are going to think twice. You cannot bring, I've seen, I'm a researcher, I've gone into the ICC books, the documents, the files I brought out. Karim Khan himself was saying that was a lie. There was no words like that. So I copied the chief prosecutor, my letter. I think, Miriam, you have read through it. 
saying, Mr. Chief Prosecutor, there you are, we are beginning the game that was there in 2007. I don't know whether this time what you say, since you are the former client, uh, the, the former boss of your client, who is actually watching the events in the stadium. Because those days, those words were said by leaders in the, in the Rift Valley, and the Ruto went ahead, said he did not hear about those words. So, are we making peace in this country, or we are making more preparing a war path? For me, maybe I'm asking me any questions, because you must have prepared questions there. If there are any, is there a way why we hide that these elections, madam, is, are not elections, is a pathway to a war after nine years? It's a pathway. If they are conducted in the way now, the way they are, I've just heard of you up to now, someone has gone to, to stop or to allow civil servants, whether they go or not, can you call that an election? Up to now, we are starting to register afresh. We are targeting 4.5 million after Ruto telling Chebukati, where are the youths who follow me every day? They went back and they have targeted areas of Mount Kenya, the biggest population. That's where the IEBC officials. If you tell ask me whether the IEBC officials are in Garissa Moyale, no, there is none. Garissa Moyale, those Masabit, Wanji, those IBC officials are not even interested. But they have gone into densely populated areas of Nairobi, Mount Kenya, east and the west. Ukambani, that's where Ruto has told Jebukati to concentrate. Because Jebukati said, if you ask him now, whether there are people in Tukana registering people in Jop, Lokichoki, he will say he doesn't have enough money to send the people there. Why? It's considered a safe territory for Mr. Ruto. So what they have got there is enough. But most of the registration is taking place in Central Kenya, in Kiambu, in Nyeri, in Kirinyaga, in Muranga, in Naikipia, in Nyandarua, in, in, in Machakos, in, in Kitui, Makweni, Mombasa. Those are the areas where they have concentrated Kilifi area, those areas. That's, and then areas like Migori, you, if you ask them, some of the officials are not even aware that there's a registration going on. So, given these circumstances, my sister, is there a free and a fair election? The money is missing. Ballot papers have contention, we are in court. We don't know whether the tender will be awarded. The server has been already fixed by Chebukati from a Ugandan company. Very linked to <laughs> some mafia from somewhere. So I, I, to me, there is no election. Uh, this is not an election. This is just a preparation of of uniforms and a good way how to fight. I don't know whether you have told people that they are present, people listen in East Africa. Our program is listened in Tanzania. Very much. I have a lot of good, big, high ranking officials in Tanzania. They listen to most of the things that we talk on this show. One of them just called me and said, you talked to President Sululu. Honestly, you remember when I said Sululu is going to reshuffle, we sack some of these people in order for him to serve. You remember, I said it. He has just sacked over, reshuffled the entire cabinet. And the professor was writing Mr. Ruto's manifesto of bottom-up. 
Professor Padma Damba has been sacked and ceremoniously. The Minister of Trade has been sacked, who was dealing with Mr. Ruto, a great friend of Ruto, Minister of Trade and Investment, sacked. So I, I was thinking before I came to this show, said, ah, is Mama looking at our notes? She, she has actually re reorganized the entire cabinet, throwing out people who were seen as puppets. You cannot, for example, the Minister of Trade invites, invites a guest from outside and uh, without the clearance from the president's office. What do you think? Kenyan companies are involved, not officially. They have not registered them here. They have been registered in another country. But the Kenyans are the ones who went there to that country and registered these companies purportedly to supply our health products, drugs. Not, they are not coming from Kenya. The drugs are coming from somewhere, but the people supplying them are Kenyan. And they are linked to one man called William Ruto. So you tell me if this is the type of is this politics of violence going to extend into several other territories? Mr. Ruto is known to be having links with the former president Bashir Omar. When Bashir Omar was overthrown, he panicked, he went there to collect money. He's also known to have links with South Sudan, one of the rebel groups that is fighting in Central Equatorial. One of the generals has money, which has left in the hands of some people. Are we looking for peace? The deputy president sits, watches, laughs as his president is being eaten by people by his lieutenants and he's laughing when when if you look at the, the clip when mr mithika minturi left the platform even the different president removed the coffee laughing so hard and not condemning at all he would have jumped on if i were him i would have jumped on the podium and condemned the actions of Mithika Binturi said this area is sensitive, you cannot use those words here. Even if you are doing it for cosmetic purposes, you are a leader of a country, you are a Jupiter leader of a country. You are trying to lead a country, unless you are going, you are trying to kill the country. Where is the peace then? Is there peace in Africa? My answer is peace is very elusive in Africa. Almost every African country has got some few elements. If you look at all the countries, Ethiopia has got no peace. Sudan, Khartoum has no peace. Libya has no peace. Mali has no peace. Mauritania has no peace. Burkina Faso has no peace. Nigeria has no peace. Chad has no peace. Central African Republic, no peace. Democratic Republic of Congo, no peace. Uh -huh. Tell me, can we go on? Can we go on? The only countries in East Africa that have peace is Kenya and Uganda and Tanzania. Plus Rwanda. Burundi, there is no peace. Rebels are coming from where? Overthrowing the government. Malawi, no peace. Mozambique, no peace. Zimbabwe, yes, peaceful. Botswana, yes, peaceful. South Africa, peaceful. Angola, peaceful. Gabon, no peace. Mr. Jinping was this man who is who is walking when he's dead. You know the president of Gabon walks when he is already gone. Why he cannot retire? I told you. 
because the whole population is gone. In, in the intelligence, uh, it has stuck there. The rest are being caught here on, on, on the road is running to go to South Africa. Where is the peace? Where is the peace? Show me a name the most ivory coast. No peace. Senegal, no peace. Morocco, Sahrawani, no peace. Algeria, the president is locked in the office. He doesn't leave office because somebody will come and take over. Tunisia, where is the peace we have? So, these are some of the things that are happening in Africa. There are more conflicts, there is more politics, more violence in our politics in Africa, in Egypt. General Assisi is ruling until 2032. At least for him, he has made peace. Madagascar, recently, four people sentenced to life for trying to overthrow the government of the DJ man. Stations, Mauritius as peace. That's why the stability of everybody banking in Mauritius. Cape Verde, Gine Konakure, there is no peace. Kone is in a hospital in Saudi Arabia. The only thing I thank the generals, the colonels there, the black, tall, black, dark guy. He allowed Kone to go for medical treatment. No African man would allow him, the man you have overthrown, to go out of the country. Gine Bissau, you know how many times they have thrown at each other until they, they have now stabilized the beach. Ghana, there is peace, but it is coming up with sanctions because they have passed a bill that the, the Western countries think is not very good because of discrimination. We don't want to talk about it on this television because they, they, they are very itchy to, to see whether you discuss it. Ghana has stumbled. Which other country, name for me, I've mentioned almost every African country. So, where is the peace? Guinea, Congo, Brazzaville, Wema has been there for almost Equatorial Guinea. Where is the peace? The guy can't travel out of the country because his own son is wanted. And he could also take over like in the way he took over the uncle. He removed his own uncle. Where is the peace? Those are most of the African countries. And the rest have left one by mistake. Djibouti is just at the peril of Western powers and Western, Western interests. China wants its own military base. They have offered it. Doc. And also, Chad, I think, is a ticking time bomb after the death of uh, Idris Deby. See, things seem to be quiet, but I don't think that is the case. Exactly. So when you look at this scenario of Africa, it's politics of violence, more politics of violence than politics of peace. That's why Uhuru, President Uhuru Kenyatta of Kenya, Say, let's try to get peace before we go. Let's bring in BBI. What's the best solution for Africa? It's the BBI. But Miriam, my dear sister and uh, Tawish, people here, Ruto Lady, yesterday you saw how he was. He took 10 minutes hammering BBI and hammering his boss. 10 minutes. Wakora Matapeli, is this a man you want for your country? You are Kenyans, I'm a Gentile preaching to the Jews. Philippians 
chapter 1 Philippians 1 and 2 Today I brought my small Bible that I have had because the whole night I've been praying. So if you open Philippians, a letter to the Philippians by Paul, he said, I might not be there to listen ye, to tell you, but there will come a time when you might not have time to listen. And that time, is approaching very fast. We are repeating the same mistakes. Kenya is repeating the same mistakes that it made in 2007. Don't blame Matanga. Don't blame anybody else. I don't know why His Excellency Dr. William Samoye Ruto has got this energy and the strength and the impetus to tell us bravadly, in a bravado way, that nobody can steal my election. Do I look like you can steal my election? So if Kenyans are not thinking, if you hear somebody talking like that, what does he have? It means he has created an army somewhere. He will be able that if you steal my election, I will unleash that rebel group. Those type of words are used by rebels like a coin. Because I have an experience in rebel activities. Those are the words that a deputy president of the Republic of Kenya should not use. And then now you can see, I don't know whether the MPs from the Mount Kenya sat there and clapped hands and drove their home cars back or flew back to Nairobi. I'm told some of them were very upset. You have a population that lives on Stockholm violence syndrome. A population that has been coerced in Eldoret. For Let me tell you, and it is better to be frank, do you know the number of people who died more? Aruya and the Kikuyus and the Ruo and the Kisi. We Ruyas died more because they don't like us, even we are neighbors. I live across there in Uganda, neighbors with these guys, the Kusebens. But when they get my tribesman, they oh. put him on a tree. And, and you know, they, they, have you seen a, a, a person taken out? Medium. Have you seen a person being skinned like a goat? I'm telling the truth. Whoever wants to penalize me is your problem. I'm not talking lies. Does it, does it occur to you? That Wafura, Kenny Wafura, Baraza. Have you seen the number of people who were actually involved in these cases? All of them, most of the OTP, OTPs came from that area because they were the first hand witness recruited by Kenny Wafura. They became witnesses and they have suffered quite a lot, medium. Even their families have suffered. I don't want to, to underestimate the power of people having the money. So if this continues the way it is continuing now, the government has to step in to stop this election. Me, I am not, I, I don't want to beat about the bush on this platform. If you, if I have wronged somebody, if you are going to die because an election is not taking place, then die now. But if I were President Uru Kenyatta, it is better to conduct a very good election 
than to conduct a bad election that is going to destroy the property and the things. When you have two proponents, two opponents, none of them can easily be pushed over. <laughs> Raira is not a pushover. He must, he might have respected Uhuru, but he, I don't think he can respect the other guy who calls him names, Matapedi, the word, Munyororo. This, this, look, what is all this? I'm pleading to you. I am Paul, a Gentile, preaching to the Jews. Look, you can't call a human being Munyororo. He's a human being. Call him Raida. Him at Matapedi. It is. Those are not very good names. They don't sound as if we are in an election. They sound that we are heading to the bush. I am speaking from an experienced point of view. That in 1982, across in my country, we had a gentleman who used to speak, give us warnings. And today that gentleman is none other than His Excellency, the President of Republic of Uganda, President Museveni. I am here. I'm an experience. I, am, I can give you the person I had it. I was working for about it. If there is anybody who can say I was not working for what put up your hand and the legs and the stomach. And open your stomach and give to people to eat. Because I was working. The man warned us. He said this election has been stolen. And I'm not going to accept this election. We thought it was a joke. Obote being a very good guy, he, he said, no, I'm going to call my younger man to talk. We said he's not going to talk. Since you are the same thing we are doing here. We are seeing a danger here. It is coming here. I am talking from a personal experience. If anybody who does not want to listen to me, it's up to you. My role is to give out information as a media outlet. And I'm giving you information for free. Ruto will not accept the results. Put your legs here, your hands here. I will cut them with a knife. Uh, somebody can cut them and the bed. If you want to understand Ruto properly, read the book, The Lion and the Jewel by Lakunone, uh, by, by so Wally Sonic. Go and pick a copy and read. Read the book, no longer at ease. A civil servant who talks about, who, who takes a bribe, then turns around to say, what is a bribe? Obi or Kwonko. Am I wrong, Mr. Hey, where, where I, Mr. Wesonga? Am I wrong? You are very right, Dr. Matsanga, very right. I went to school in 1973. I was reading the book for my literature exams of East African Certificate of Education. Not Uganda, not Kenya Certificate. My fault. Ruto has a, a Kenya Certificate of Education. I have a Uganda East African Certificate of Education. Nyambie, Nyaje, let me also speak in Swahili here. Nyaje, Yes. Nobody did the exam for me. I did it and I passed. I got, I failed in mathematics. And I've told you, have I hidden mathematics? I got a zip, a nine. The rest, I passed. Hallelujah. Even in biology, which I never expected, Kumba could have become a doctor. Physics, physical science. Physics and the chemistry. My God, medium. I hammered seven. Biology, seven. 
English language. Three. English literature. Distinction number two. This is the boy you hear here. Religious knowledge. A credit three. When you are here, geography. Number three, credit three. We were marked in credits. Distinctions. Mathematics, a nine. I got, <laughs> I got a failure, nine. I failed mathematics. And I cannot go and I pretend to be an accountant somewhere. Haki ya mungu nakimbia. Mass is, is the madoa doa on your, on your <laughs> results leave. <laughs> yes. It is a very big, my God. Daddy, my daddy did not spare me. He said, I knew you would fail mathematics. But I was watching all this English language. Number five. Credit number five. Biology. I hammered a pass eight. And then I was going to be a doctor. So I had a mixture of what do I take at A-levels in 1974? I went for what we call BCG. Wesonga, what does it mean? BCG. It means biology, chemistry, and the geography. geography yeah. I would have become a very terrible person. Then I had another set, divinity. I was going to take divinity to become a preacher. <laughs> eh? Divinity, geography, and English language, uh, literature. The only thing that shocked me, which I never expected, is past eight in history. Yet I did not so well the history of Rubengula, Zulu, the Shaka, the Zulu. I, I, I don't know whether I wrote wrongly or the examiner woke up on the wrong side and they gave me a pass eight. That's 1974. Here I am today, Miriam. So, when you look at all those signs and somebody is telling you in 1981, 82, Mr. Museven said, you have cheated my election. I am going to the bush. We thought it was a joke. His Excellency today is the President of the Republic of my country. The only mistake that we made while we are in power, and for, for sure, God bless me, not me, at least for me, I said it. Others, when we met in Nairobi on 28th in the morning in Ibohongu Stadium, we wanted to slaughter each other. Because there was a government in power, in Kampala. We were now useless, walking like a maggots that have lost the mud. Have you ever taken a, a, ma a maggot out of the mud? Or a snail, not a snail, the worm, a worm. Where Songa, I'm now teaching African anthropological difficulty, <laughs> anthropology, and the Tawish. Take a worm out of the mud, it will dry. So we became worms in the Hongu Stadium under the Masi. Or President Moy. If he wanted to take us back, he would have thrown us across. But he was very Schumann until he became in Schumann later. And started taking us one by one. We lost the government when people warned us of an election, a bad election. And indeed, I want to take this opportunity to apologize on behalf of my or President Roberta, who is dead, that the election was 
a sham. And the people of Uganda should quote me if they want, authoritatively, that having studied political science to the highest level on planet Earth and seen what we should put in an election and having observed several elections across the world in Zimbabwe, in East Timor, in Serbia, in Ghana, in Nigeria, in, in South Africa, in Tanzania, in Kenya here, having observed the elections, I think the 1980 elections in Uganda were fake. So I have to apologize on behalf of my party and on behalf of the departed president. We are sorry. We are very sorry. If you gave me to become the chairperson of the electoral commission in Uganda, I would not hold that election. Any type of election like that, I would cancel it. So here we are. So violence in politics is that way. Violence, there is more violence on the African continent than there is peace. Kenya is a member of the African Peace Commission of AU. Kenya is a member of the United Nations Security Council. The nations that fall under Kenya's jurisdiction are very clear, including the Sub-Saharan territory that is swamped with rebels in Congo. And I had forgotten, I don't know whether Tawish remembered it. Mr. Harun Eyadin, why Mr. Ruto does not talk about Mr. Harun Eyadin anymore? You, have you had the latest? Mr. Eyadin Harun was linked to terrorists. He was not a, a fruit, a new, what does it, what is it called? Um, Mukulima Wamatunda Yakisasa. Is it the fruits? Is it the farmer of modern what? Well, we're so help me here. Because that's how he got the money. But that farmer turned out to be a terrorist linked to terror groups that are based in Congo. So you can see for yourself. Now here we are, I just got that report this morning. <laughs> I said, ah, so that's why Mr. Ruto cannot go and lie again. His presence in Western region is simple. Is to have people coming with money in the bags to give him the money. He's being given a lot of money according to the sources clause. Since the, nobody can go to the gates inside, but serious sources indicate huge money has been pumped in, brought in. That's why they are now talking. And you will see them talk. If it was not this Madawadawa thing that has now changed the narrative in Mount Kenya, I submit. Very well. And for those who don't know, perhaps uh, the background of that uh, story that Dr. Matsanga just shared, let me just read a bit of it uh, before uh, Daniel Wesonga comes in on page four on the Daily Nation. Deputy President William Ruto yesterday stamped UDA's authority in his political stronghold as he received blessings from elders to vie for the presidency in a day of high drama and controversial speeches that attracted the attention of police and investigations. Leaders allied to him also turned the pressure on rebels in the Rift Valley, urging voters to kick them out and elect those loyal to the deputy president in statements that attracted the uh, the attention of the director of public prosecutions who accused Meru Senator Mithi Kalinturi of hate speech. So this is what Mithi Kalinturi said. He said it in Kiswahili, but uh, the Daily Nation has, uh, uh, has uh, 
has uh, put it in English. So I'll just quote that for the sake of our viewers from across uh, the world. This is what um, uh, Senator said. You people of Uwasin Kishu don't play mind games with Kenyans and what I'm asking you is to remove for us rebel leaders. They cannot be backing William Ruto while we are in Mount Kenya and in Meru when others here are against him. The word Maduadoa that he used is an emotive phrase that was used as a court to profile communities targeted for violent evictions from Rift Valley during the post-election violence in 2007 reports by the Kregler and Waki commissions that investigated the violence revealed. And uh, later on, he said he was misquoted and he said, my message was very clear. I don't owe anybody any explanation. Whoever does not support William Bruto in the region should not be elected. So that is what he's saying he meant. So he's saying that uh, uh, you know, people misquoted what he, what he meant by the statements he made. But even by him saying that uh, the people uh, who do not support William Bruto in Rift Valley should not be elected, who is he to tell people what to do? Uh, and by using such a language that he chose to use that he already knew was problematic, uh, Daniel Wesonga, can you escape responsibility? Uh, thank you so much, Miriam Ogutu. And uh, it doesn't uh, matter the, uh, whichever way you chop it. That was uh, uh, a statement which was made in a very, very stale moment. And uh, it was very, very uh, reckless for such a leader to mention such a statement. Uh, in the uh, midst of a campaign, and especially uh, considering that we are heading into a general election where our president is retiring and uh, we have a succession in place, where emotive, um, emotions are actually quite high than any other election. You realize in, uh, when you're having a, tra uh, a, a transitional elections, people tend to be a bit uh, vibrant in the way they campaign and all that. And therefore, that provides a recipe for violence uh, in whichever country that uh, you, 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 want, you might want to take it to. But uh, when you talk about Madoadoa, that is a term that has a historical uh, background. That is a term that uh, Kenyans have had since 1992, uh, when uh, Kikuyus uh, who live in uh, Molo, who live in parts of Nakuru and other parts of Rift Valley were targeted because they were seen as not to being uh, natives. And also people tell you that even in 207, 208, Kisis, Kikuyus, and other people who are not from Rift Valley were targeted uh, using the same term, Madoadoa. And uh, yesterday I happened to read uh, Dr. Matsanga's update uh, where ICC itself has an evidence, uh, some evidence where that term Madoadoa was used to actually flush out uh, people who are uh, opposed to uh, uh, William Ruto's camp that by that time ODM. So to me, I think uh, whichever way you chop it, we have a constitution in this country, a constitution which allows every Kenyan, remember those elected leaders are Kenyans and they are protected by the constitution of Rift Valley. I think that was a, a, an inflammatory remark. And the only way we can go about it is by allowing the National Cohesion and in, uh, Integration Commission to go on with this work and uh, make sure that uh, Linturi is held before the corridors of justice and he pays for his ignorance, he pays for his incitement and let it be a warning shot. We've seen most of the deputy president's uh, lieutenants talking about profiling a certain individuals. Linturi is not the first one. We have the Nandi governor. We have uh, Kericho Senator uh, Cheriot. We have the Nandi Senator uh, Cherarge and many other Kalenjin uh, senators and uh, leaders who have been talking about Madoadoa in Rift Valley. So I, we don't know if these people are just testing waters or maybe uh, William Ruto is the one who is sending them to say that because William Ruto was in the same meeting. But unfortunately, uh, Miriam, as it is, he didn't even also reprimand uh, this particular uh, leader for, uh, for uttering such uh, divisive words. So he might be part of the plot. And therefore, we, we will stand against this, Miriam. We want the NCIC, we want the DCI, and we want all the relevant agencies uh, to prevent these people from actually uh, beating up the drums of war. William Ruto has a history of violence. He thrives in division politics. And even uh, we, we have a tape record where he has also talked about Madoadoa and people who are not supposed to be in Rift Valley. And that is the truth, Miriam. So if we do not take action about it, we shall go uh, the way Rwanda genocide went. When people were talking about these cockroaches and no one paid attention, uh, whatever followed is that almost uh, close to a million people uh, lost their lives. 
Very well. In the genocide that was the biggest genocide in the world by that time, submit. Okay, very well, thank you so much. So, of course, the sentiments received quite a, a varied reaction from cross-section of Kenyans, and of course, Gatundu, Member of Parliament, Moses Kuria, also had this to say. I am a close friend of the Deputy President, however, I am far. If you are in Eldoret and near here, tell him to rebuke this talk. It doesn't matter whether it is said by Linturi or Oscar Sudi. It matters that it is being said in Eldoret sports ground a few meters from KAD Church Kiamba in Bant Forest, Jamani Madoadoa Tena. Uh, that is what uh, I got to the South, uh, the Member of Parliament Moses Kuria. He said it does not even matter whether it's Linturi saying it or Oscar Sudi. The fact remains we need. Yes, Miriam, you seem to have got into trouble there. Are we okay? Are we okay broadcasting headquarters? So thank you very much. Miriam was talking about sentiments that are coming out from so many people across the world. Tawish, you yourself, I have explained the question of violence. I think Miriam got off and it remains me and uh, the rest of you. As we conclude, Tawish, is there peace in Africa? Is the peace in Africa? What? Uh, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Doctor Ri, and thank you, the uh, colleague panelists, for the submissions you've made. Uh, indeed, Doctor Masanga, what is happening today in the continent of Africa is really uh, worrying. And um, looking on to the, of course, uh, the happenings, especially yesterday in uh, Eldoret, um, it is something that uh, reminds uh, the Kenyan people and, the, of course, the globe of the bitter memories and the painful memories of 2007-2008 post-fall uh, skirmishes. And um, in a time that we have a Deputy President William Ruto uh, who perceives uh, Eldoret as his uh, political uh, bedrock or stronghold to, to say the least, uh, he should have really even come out and reprimanded uh, Senator Mithika Linturi or anyone who is trying to, of course, uh, uh, to propagate um, uh, scaremongering. Uh, and this is something that um, the National Cohesion and Integration Commission also uh, must be must really take, um, of course, action against because again we cannot uh, tolerate such kind of um, actions coming, especially from our leaders who are supposed to be role models, uh, people who are supposed to preach uh, harmony and peace amongst uh, all ethnic communities in the country at a time when you are getting into this. Uh, a success, succession politics. So, Dr. Masanga, indeed, it's very, very unfortunate uh, the remarks by Senator Mithika Linturi. And I'm very, very happy that uh, the relevant authorities have taken up the matter. And as we speak, of course, uh, the uh, senator has been uh, arrested. I understand he's at the DCI headquarters. Uh, we really want to see what kind of um, defense he's going to put up in as far as the remarks he made yesterday uh, in Eldoret um, are concerned. Uh, because again, you remember what happened in 2007, 2008, when we lost uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, Kenyan people, uh, particularly in Rift Valley region. Um, so many people also are displaced uh, by, because of the, uh, the violence that erupted after the 2007 uh, general election. And um, when you have leaders um, who uh, do make such kind of uh, words or make, uh, do, take such kind of actions at the detriment of the harmony and the unity that the Kenyan people are enjoying today. It, it begs the question, Dr. Masanga, what is the priority for these leaders? Is it about the unity of the people or is it about their ambition and how they are going to become president or to become whichever position they are aspiring for? So uh, it's, it's despicable. It's very, very unfortunate. And um, what I was awaiting to see yesterday was uh, the DP himself, assuming maybe Senator Methical in Turi, uh, just went off the lane. Uh, he could have come out and reprimanded uh, that, um, uh, the, those remarks by Senator Methical in Turi, and you could clearly also see 
uh, the same being, um, of course, replicated by other speakers who spoke during that particular rally. So what kind of message are we sending to the country? Have we partitioned this um, country into regions or into ethnic blocks to a point that uh, there are people who are not uh, supposed to be uh, to live and work in uh, certain places in this country? Uh, is it the kind of message really that we are sending? And for Deputy President William Ruto and the position he holds today in government, being the second in command, he should be at the forefront really championing for peace and the unity. After all, he will want to govern people. So if we are going to have uh, politicians really, um, of course, uh, spewing head as it is today, uh, what, what kind of a nation are we going to have, uh, say, after the August uh, general election, if at all we are going to have that election? So these are things that we must reprimand. It is something that uh, our politicians and leaders have gotten used to. Uh, they've become so comfortable with, um, of course, the head speech and uh, inciting communities against one another, especially when we head into election. It's not something that is so unique to Kenya. It's not uh, something limited to Kenya, something that is happening uh, mostly in most African countries, especially when we head to the general election. So this kind of um, exclusion when it comes to politics, uh, this kind of uh, head and uh, propagating, uh, of course, uh, head uh, against the communities in the country is something that we must really call uh, to a stop. I submit, Dr. Ari. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. We have done our best. We hope the people of Kenya will take in some of our points, experiences that we have shown, the examples we have given, and make a better Kenya. I thank you very much. I thank the broadcasting uh, mobile unit. Thank you very much for standing by us. This station is therefore for Africa with Africa by Africa. Thank you. God bless. <laughs>